Welcome everybody to this latest installment in the International Free Expression Project's visionary series of conversations uh, with people who defend free expression rights around the world. Um, I'm Greg Victor. I'm the founder and CEO of the International Free Expression Project. And today we're going to be talking to Corinne Vela, the sister of Maltese journalist Daphne Karuna Galiza, who was murdered four years ago for exposing corruption in uh, government and uh, the corporate world. Daphne was only 53. First, I'd like to just say a few words about the International Free Expression Project. We're dedicated to promoting free expression rights um, by leveraging our own initiatives and uh, those of allied organizations. Um, our four core initiatives are to build a, public, uh, a work of public art symbolizing free expression, something iconic um, that's recognized around the world, uh, to build a home for free expression in a former newspaper press room um, with all kinds of educational activity, arts, um, performance, um, and lectures, and the like. Third, we um, are sponsoring the invention of new immersive educational tools and activities to drive home the importance of free expression rights to people. And fourth, we're supporting artists uh, by commissioning uh, and exhibiting their work. Um, find out more about us at our website, ifep.io. Before welcoming Corinne, I'd like to tell you uh, about her sister, uh, Daphne. Daphne was a Maltese writer, journalist, blogger, and anti-corruption activist. She was renowned for her relentless investigative journalism, reporting on government corruption, money laundering, links between Malta's online gambling industry and organized crime, and many other types of government and business malfeasance and criminal activity. Um, she continued to investigate the powerful, uh, despite intimidation, threats, lawsuits, arrests. On October 16th, 2017, Daphne was killed when a car bomb was detonated inside her vehicle. Um, this attracted widespread local and international condemnation. That December, three men were arrested in connection with the car bomb attack, and one has been charged in her murder, and uh, the case is still ongoing. Um, and um, meanwhile, in 2018, an international consortium of 45 journalists published the Daphne Project, a collaboration to complete Daphne's investigative work, ensure justice uh, for her assassination, and continue her fight for press freedom and liberal democracy. Daphne's family set up the Daphne Caruna Galizia Foundation uh, to promote uh, press freedom and democracy uh, around the world and in Malta in particular. So please welcome Daphne's sister, Corinne Vela, who is the media relations director for the foundation. Uh, Corinne, welcome. It's good to see you. Good to meet you too, Greg. Tell us about Daphne. Uh, what kind of person was she um, when you were growing up uh, together? Did she display uh, the kind of courage and determination that she um, you know, just became so evident later in her life and in her journalism? It, it, it's hard to be objective about somebody you grew up with, right? So yes. when we were growing up, I, well, I suppose what we could connect to her later work was that she loved reading and writing, um, which wasn't unusual at the time. No internet, TV was only a few hours a day. You know, books were a form of entertainment connection to the wider world. But it was also quite important in our household. You know, you got books as presents. You know, you, you were encouraged to to read a lot. Um, it was seen as a good thing. Um, and she often sort of wrote stories, you know, the sort of things that children do. Um, but there was no indication then of wanting to be a journalist. The possibility, the, the, the possibility of being a journalist was so remote, just didn't exist. Newsrooms were staffed by men. Um, news reporting was very dry. It was sort of almost telegraphic reporting, bare facts, no opinions, no bylines. So the idea of being a journalist came quite late 
you know, in, in, in when late in her, not late in her life, but, you know, late adolescence, early adulthood. Um, and that came about when she was already married. She already had her sons. Um, and she couldn't fathom why the newspapers we read every day totally did not reflect how people lived. You know, they didn't speak about this sort of everyday experience of people's lives. They sort of talked about things that happened, but not what people thought about them. There was no color. There were no bylines, nothing. Um, and she thought, I'll give it a shot. She wrote a few columns, uh, sent them to an editor and thought, well, nothing might come of it, but I had fun writing them. And a couple of days later, she gave him a call thinking he's going to say thanks, but no thanks. And he said, I really like this. Can you write some more? And that's how it all began. And she was the first woman to, to write a political column. But she was the first person to write a political column. And it, you know, she did it as a woman using her own name, which is very unusual at the time. Mm. So that gave her a lot of curiosity value. People liked what she wrote because the tone was so different. But they also were you know, intrigued by the fact that it was this column with the face of a woman at the top and a woman's name. Um, and given the circumstances of the time, a lot of people said, but you don't really write this yourself, do you? It's your husband who's really writing for you. So you know, that was the sort of environment she was working in. Um, but she did it and she, she kept on that work for years. She started her blog in 2008, you know, in frustration at the slowness of the print news cycle and, you know, online publication and, you know, going through all the hoops with editors and so on. Um, she started her blog just before an election. And um, the first column she wrote was called Zero Tolerance for Corruption. Mm. She started up, started up as a sort of very uh, spontaneous it was a very spontaneous decision, and within hours, her son had set the blog up and running, um, and it took off. You know, people were really interested in what she had to say. It was very quick. Um, you know, she could publish whenever she liked, and it became a rallying point, particularly during times of, you know, political tension you know, around an election, for example. And it got so popular that her readership was higher than the total amount of readership and circulation of newspapers in Malta generally. She had hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of readers. Um, she had readers around the world, in effect. Mm -hmm. She often joked about having a worldwide network of spies. Uh, it was a bit of an ironic way of putting things, but she really did have connections around the world because people would send her information or get in touch with her because they knew they were dealing with her. Let's say I've got something to say, but I don't want to put it in email. And she says, here, she would say, here's my number. Contact me on WhatsApp or whatever. Um, so it was both very personal and very general and very informative um, as blog. Um, and then it became so important that it became dangerous. And um, we know that her murder was connected to her work. What? took her into politics uh, in the first place? Why was it important to her? I, I noticed that she, at the age of 18, was arrested for um, taking part in a protest uh, against yeah. the government. Uh, what, what drove yeah. her? What was her interest in that? The, uh, the, the times we grew up in, I mean, you've got to remember that Malta was a colony and had been for 170 something years uh, or thereabouts. Um, country was only decolonized in 1964, which is the year she was born. So as an independent republic, it's very young as a country. Um, the, the times we lived in, you know, the post-colonial period where things are shifting and changing, and then there was a change in government, and we had a, you know, a government which was very uh, brought in the idea of socialism, but didn't quite work in practice. It was all about you know, grabbing power for themselves. You know, things weren't working as they should. The institutions were fragile because they were new. Uh, it was very easy for somebody with a strong arm to come in and take over everything and control everything directly. So the times were very turbulent when we were growing up. And the protest you, you uh, mentioned there, that was at a time when government was trying to shut down private schools. Private schools at the time were run by the Catholic Church mainly, and um, the Catholic Church was the last dependent power standing. 
So it was a way of, of taking over the last independent um, you know, power unit. We were all educated in private schools run by the church. You know, the, there's good and bad about that. But the fact is, if you, you should have had that choice if you want it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the government's decision to shut down those schools and sort of socialize the whole system, you know, provoked a lot of public outrage. And there were these protests frequently. And it was that one of those protests that Daphne was arrested along with a couple of her friends kept in a cell overnight and forced to sign a false confession. Um, and then eventually prosecuted for an illegal gathering. And it was just totally absurd. You know, in the mm. end, the, the court threw out the charges altogether. But it was a formative experience. There's no doubt about that. Um, the thing is about politics, you, you sort of can't not think about politics because it's so much part of everyday life. Everything is somehow connected to what the government does or doesn't do. And um, so she was largely a political commentator. So she, she covered politics mainly. And she wrote an opinion column at first, and then went into news editing because she helped to set up a newspaper and then continued with her, her column and then eventually set up her own blog. But politics is so, it was, remained, an, remained her focus until the very end. Mm -hmm. So she did discover crime, but she did that by covering politics. That shows you the connection right. of what she discovered. When she was um, arrested at that protest at the age of 18, yeah. did that kind of put her on the, the government's radar? Um, so she was sort of being watched even from that age. And how did it kind of her um, career evolve? Uh, uh, yeah. it's, it's hard to tell whether, you know, there was a sort of surveillance system in the place. Um, I'm not too sure government was sophisticated enough to do that, but certainly, you know, people would have been marked out because you know, why else would you arrest someone? Yeah. Um, but it was only in later years that it really became risky for her. There was a time when she could go to a political rally and then write about it afterwards, uh, and she would have no problem with it, and people would not have a problem with her doing that. But in recent years, just before she died, especially, it became the situation became really hostile. We know for certain there was a dehumanization campaign waged against her, led by a political party um, armed with its own media. They had TV, radio, newspaper, and then eventually social media, Facebook groups running into tens of thousands. You know, th the, the pressure on her escalated in the years before she was killed. Mm -hmm. um, and it largely came through her being discredited in this way. So this is, we were in this crazy situation where people would talk about what she wrote, but government would pretend she hadn't written anything. So somebody in government, you know, including the prime minister, would be asked, what do you think of? And said, well, I heard about this rumor on the Internet. Uh, you know, so she was reduced to being a no-name rumor on the Internet as opposed to a person who was, uncovering one scandal after another. Um, but we do know that people in government did read what she wrote, so much so that they paid all this attention to her and waged this campaign against her. Because you see, yeah. the political party that led this campaign against her eventually got into government, and the campaign continued. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a public inquiry into the circumstances of her murder, which we fought for for a couple of years. It closed earlier this year. One of the findings was that there was this campaign against her led from inside the office of the prime minister. Mm. So, you know, anyone who says they didn't pay attention to what she wrote is obviously lying yeah. because they paid a lot of attention to the point that they actually waged a campaign against what they saw was their common enemy. Yeah. It sounds like the campaign was so multifaceted. I mean, there were the threats yes. and arrests and physical. Yep. Um, uh, well, threats, um, and this de uh, dehumanizing campaign, yep. I take it was to discredit her, to accuse her of corruption, to question her morals and motives and capabilities and all of that kind of thing. Is that how? Yeah, well, there was dehumanization, you know? there was discreditation. So the dehumanization was to reduce her to a cipher. There was a comment made about her by a somebody who used to write for a political newspaper. He was a man much older than us. He was our father's age. Um, 
And he was sort of intrigued by the sight and sound of this young woman writing all these things, being totally outspoken. And so he called her, he used the word in Maltese, Sahara, which, is, um, which translates as witch. Um, but actually, it, a better description is sorceress. The sorceress is, you know, it, there's a sort of white magic about it. You're bewitching as opposed to being evil. You're the good witch, the white witch. He was fascinated with her, but somewhere along the way, this got warped into being the outcast, you know, the witch. Mm -hmm. um, and that cipher was used relentlessly in political cartoons. There was a program on TV where there was this character called the Witch of Benio, which is the place where she lived. It was horrendous. And the people involved in that came were at the heart of the party that got into government. And one of the people who worked directly on that campaign ran a blog from the prime minister's office um, targeting her. There were like 500 blog posts about her, photographs of her cartoons, um, malicious rumors, photographs of her house. It was horrendous. But, you know, by, by reducing her to a, a non-human, um, then it becomes easy to deal with her as a non-human and think, well, if we get rid of her, nothing's, nobody's going to care. The other side was to discredit her, and that was done also relentlessly. The uh, biggest stories she had, you know, were in the more recent years when uh, the government changed in 2013, and Daphne was very skeptical about how and why they got into government and the people at the core of the government and what they were up to. Um, and she had a whole string of stories about how they were on to corrupt deals and so on. And eventually she found out that they, you know, a couple of people were setting up companies in Panama, you know, the, the Panama Papers validated what she wrote and so on. Mm -hmm. But the government discredited all of those stories. The people she wrote about never resigned. They weren't forced out. Um, and she was made to look at like she was making things up. You see, all you have to do is not prove that she's wrong. All you have to do is cast doubt. That's how disinformation works. Yeah. So by casting doubt and then dehumanizing her is to create a situation where people don't believe what she says. That was the idea. Yeah. You don't need everybody to not believe. You just need enough people to not believe what she says to show yourself up politically. Mm -hmm. And um, that worked for a number of years. Is, and there um, are people today who discredit her, even though there's huge amounts of evidence that's been corroborated. Yeah. Is the dehumanizing and discrediting campaign continuing after her death? I assume it the power, continues. for example, is not something, you know, the government or a lot of business leaders want to see, uh, you know. It continued. It right. continues even now. It, what happened was when Daphne died, you know, all those people have been unleashed against her they suddenly lost their targets. So that resentment, that anger, whatever, was directed at other people. So it went, you know, it, it's directed against activists, directed against her own son. Um, you know, her son was blamed for her murder. It, that rumor still goes around today. People saying, you know, it's his fault and why did he do this and so on, um, suggesting that he was in league with the people actually put the bomb in her car. Um, there were sort of denials of her stories being factual. There were, you know, accusations that she was making things up or that she, you know, it, it just went on and on. It still carries on now. Every so often, it, it, some of these rumors resurge. Uh, you know, the, the social media is really not helpful there because it's really hard to stem the flood once it gets out there. You know, we're, we're up against organized groups of tens of thousands of people. How do you stop a rumor there? Yeah. And of course, that interferes with truth, you know, seeking the truth. You know, if you yeah. muddy the waters enough, people can't see things clearly. Um, and then it becomes easier to hide information or to, yeah. to, to discredit investigations or to discredit criminal proceedings and so on. Um, so, yes, it does continue. Mm -hmm. Not perhaps with the same intensity as before Daphne was killed, but it, that's simply because it's more diffuse. There are more targets yeah. now, but right. it can be incredibly hostile, and it is terrible to have to face that, that, all of that. What did Daphne say about the threats against her, about these campaigns against her? How did she react? Um, did she ever waver? Did she ever kind of pull her punches in a story? She didn't, no. That, that's the whole point. You know, they tried everything, and in the end, it took a bomb. Mm -hmm. it, it really 
she really did not waver. There was there was just one time that she stopped writing for a little bit. That was after the election in 2017, when she had exposed story after story after story after story, and the same people were re-elected. Um, and shortly after there was the, the government was reconfirmed, her, um, her own son had, you know, just around the time of that election, her son who was a diplomat, he had been posted to India, um, a post he was very happy in. Um, and then he was recalled at short notice. And she realized, obviously, you know, the hostility towards us being transferred to her sons, and that disturbed her. So there were only two things that stopped her writing. That was one of them. The other was a bomb. What is the extent of corruption and um, the state of uh, free expression uh, in Malta today? And what, you know, impact did... Uh, Daphne's murder uh, have the uh, the, you know, the World Press Freedom Index, which is produced by the Reporters Without Borders. That annual index is really important because it shows that press freedom all over the world has been reduced. So it remains a problem, and it's, it's an escalating problem. Journalists are less and less free. When Daphne was killed, Malta's ranking in that index crashed by like 18 places or thereabouts. The following year, it fell even further. And Malta has not recovered in that index ever since. The um, situation for journalists here is that, yes, you can report, but there are very, I would say, almost no protection mechanisms. Nothing has changed systemically here since Daphne was killed. And, you know, journalists now work in an environment where they know they can be killed because it's happened. Mm. You see, it might have seemed, you know, possible but not credible before, but now we know certainly it can happen. And, the, you know, the mechanisms to prevent that are simply not there. Mm. We know that's been confirmed. Free expression, well, it's protected as law. I mean, it's a fundamental human right, but, you know, Fundamental human rights are worthless if you can if you can do certain things which are considered progressive, but then you get killed for, for telling the truth. That doesn't make sense. You either have rights or you don't. The problem with all of that is people don't necessarily understand that a journalist's ability to work freely is not just about that journalist. It's about everybody else's right to know. Everybody else's right to be informed. Everybody else's right to make informed decisions about what happens in public life, how public money is used, and so on. People here are not sensitized to what role media occupy in what is meant to be a democracy. There's only so much that can be explained by the country being young. I think a lot of the problem is that people with a grip on power and a grip on, you know, a, a big sector of the media can use and abuse that to uphold rights or to bypass them altogether. So a lot of people here have a warped idea of how media should work. And um, it remains a problem. And that's reflected in indices, which we've seen. Um, what's the state of the investigation into Daphne's murder? The investigation is still open. There are three sets of criminal proceedings in the court. The, you mentioned earlier that three men were arrested in December 2017. They were arraigned the same month. One of them has pleaded guilty as part of a plea bargain, so he's been sentenced for just to 15 years. The other two are supposed to go to trial. The trial has not started yet. And the soonest we can expect is sometime next year. There's another, there was another high profile arrest in November 2019, and uh, that man was arraigned. He's now been indicted on charges of commissioning Daphne's murder and forming part of a criminal group to commit the crime and to finance the murder. He has been indicted, but he has not gone to trial yet. And earlier this year, another two people were arraigned. They are charged with supplying the murder weapon. But they're at the pre-trial stage, so compilation of evidence is ongoing. Mm -hmm. No trials, and um, the only conviction is just the result of a plea bargain. But the investigation remains open because 
we believe that Daphne's murder was co connected to her work. It wasn't a hate crime. It wasn't revenge. It was an attempt to silence and to prevent further publication. That's, you know, it, it's provably, you know, in our minds, it's provably the case. Um, so we also want to see prosecutions for political corruption because we know, and now it's documented, that the state of impunity that existed here was cultivated by government malpractice and malfeasance. And um, that also made Daphne's murder possible. But so far, there have not been any high-profile prosecutions for political mm -hmm. corruption. Do you have any confidence that there will be, that there will be justice in, in Daphne's murder or uh, any it, serious action yeah. against corruption? It's not going to happen without a fight. We know that for certain. It's not going to happen without a fight. The institutions that are supposed to make the country work, they were hollowed out, you know, you know, emasculated, what, call it what you will. There was a situation of state capture, you know, that people who had bad intent got into government and proceeded to sort of steadily take over institutions. This was documented in the public inquiry report, where they, they rec the, the judges on the panel recognized that Malta was moving towards a situation of becoming a mafia state, where you know, a culture of impunity and as a takeover institutions are spreading so fast. And that pr process was only arrested by Daphne's murder and the backlash it provoked. So what she was writing, basically, was documenting you know, the progression of you know, Malta becoming a practical practically a criminal state. Will we see justice? Well, the institutions that fail to protect her are the ones we have to deal with now. So key people have changed. Some things have started to work a little bit better, but it is a very difficult situation to be in. And will we see prosecution for high profile corruption? I'd like to think we will. But we haven't seen it yet. Will we see justice for the actual murder? I don't think we're going to see that immediately. But when trials start, that's when we'll have an indication of how things are going to go. And definitely we want to see people jailed for Daphne's murder. But we also want to see people jailed for the corruption she exposed. But more than anything, we want to see systems changed to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. So um, will justice be served? It's not going to happen easily. Yeah. But that's why we have the foundation and that's why we work with so many other groups to make sure these things happen. Yeah. Well, tell us about what the foundation does. Well, the Daphne Caruana Galicia Foundation is uh, um, you know, effectively a memorial to Daphne herself, but it was set up to provide a framework for the, you know, all the work that family is doing. Well, we sort of came to fighting for justice within a situation of state capture. You know you're not going to get things done very easily. Mm. So, you know, alliances need to be formed. You need to reach out to groups outside more to work with free expression groups and so on. So what the foundation does is provides an entity which can work as a framework for all the work that, uh, that is being done. Uh, it is It was set up by Daphne's husband and sons. I work for the foundation full time as a volunteer. There are a couple of other members of staff. Daphne's eldest son is the director. He works full time for the foundation. His brothers are on the on the board of the foundation, so they keep an eye on things as well. And what the foundation does primarily is work on the campaign for justice, but it doesn't stop there. There are projects online like a public interest litigation network, which is an access to justice initiative. That's Malta's first access to justice initiative, which is non-governmental, you know, enabling people to, to, to gain access to the courts, gain access to legal services. The idea there is that individual cases can be exemplary in that, you know, by applying the law in an individual case, you can actually change a system by pushing all the right levers. The, that's the idea there. Um, and people who's, who, who do have a case to be made might not have the resources. So this is what the, the network does. And that's something the foundation set up. 
We mm. also set up a uh, an investigative journalism center, which is basically a platform for collaboration among museums in Malta. That was set up only last year, and we had an investigation that you know involved collaboration between newsrooms in Malta and internationally. We called it the Passport Papers, which is basically about the sale of passports, who's buying them. You know, it's a legitim it's a legitimized transaction, yes, but um, who's buying them? Why are they buying them for those people? Um, so we ran an investigation published last year, and that, that investigation is still open. But largely, a lot of the work I do is working with media, you know, responding to questions, um, supporting campaigns, connecting with international NGOs that work on free expression, press freedom. Um, we collaborate with other organizations to end SLAPs, the strategic lawsuits against public participation. That's a huge problem. So we're working on documenting that across Europe and campaigning for legislation to change across Europe. We're part of a coalition that's doing that. Um, lots of stuff, basically. We monitor all the hearings and the criminal proceedings. We monitored all the hearings and the public inquiry. We work with the other organizations to, to push the message out that, you know, things don't have to be as they are. Yeah. And we want to, to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, can the United States do anything to help? Uh, is it doing anything to help? Well, the United States is a very big place. There were lots of agencies and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's much more complex as a state than Malta is. I, I would certainly think that the United States would be interested in what's happening because a lot of the corruption involves transnational payments, which are in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a direct connection in, in one very notorious case that Daphne wrote about. There was a bank set up here which was licensed to operate as a private work bank. And the owner was of Iranian origin, but used the same kid's passport um, and had an address in the U.S. And after he wrote about this bank, um, she had written that, you know, a huge, um, you know, a huge number of the accounts held in that bank are held by people connected to the Azeri regime, you know, which is necessarily suspect. Um, and she was, it was part of the discreditation campaign actually tackled that story. Mm -hmm. So her reporting was discredited. The um, owner of the bank was going after the newsrooms one by one using slap threats and slap tactics. Um, and that the way slap tactics work is that you write to a newsroom and you don't tell anybody you're doing it and you oblige them to not talk about it. And slowly those stories started to disappear from the media. So Daphne's stories were left in isolation, which was part of the discreditation campaign, right? Yeah. Um, and then shortly after she was killed, we find out that the owner of the bank had sued her in Arizona for $40 million dollars. So the case she would never have been able to fight. It's huge in expenses. But then sometime after that, the owner of the bank was arrested in the new US and charged on, you know, in relation to laundering money for the Iranian regime through Venezuela. So he was charged under the Terrorism Act. Um, he was released from custody and then his, the case against him was overturned, but totally on a procedural matter. Mm -hmm. oh, if he was on the radar of the US, I guess other people are as well. Yeah. But we wouldn't necessarily know about him until something like that happens. Yeah. Now, what um, can individuals do to help the foundation, to support your cause, to um, hopefully make some changes? Yeah, well, supporting the foundation would be very helpful. There's, it's uh, Daphne.Foundation. You know, there's, uh, there's a, lot, a lot about our work there. Of course, some parts of it on the website need updating, but you, you can read quite a lot about the foundation there. We work on donations of any size from anywhere in the world. You know, that's one way of supporting the programs that we run. We're tax exempt, and all the money that comes to the foundation goes into our project. Um, so that directly helps the fight, not just for justice for us, because that's not the reason that we run the foundation. It's really about making sure no journalist is ever killed again. Yeah. Um, or, you know, anybody who wants to know anything about the foundation is welcome to get in touch. 
we've got our contact details on the website. Um, I'm Corinne at Daphne.Foundation, and I'd be glad to take any questions anyone has. Yeah, we really you know, wish you the best and the foundation the best in all your work. Um, at the International Free Expression Project, we'll do anything we can to help. Thank Ask you. us, we'll do anything we can think of on our own. That includes this interview. We'll try to get it spread around as far as we can uh, with Thank the you. help of allied organizations. Um, and, um, you know, I'd just like to thank you so much for um, taking the time uh, to let people know about more about Daphne, uh, about her cause, about the foundation. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's tuning in. Um, Colcom Foundation is helping to finance the Visionary Series, and um, we wish you well. Thanks so much, Corinne. Thank you very much, and thank you for doing this and uh, for choosing to, to honor Daphne in this way. Yeah, you're welcome. You. It's a privilege, yeah.